Any questions from the floor, audience? Uh, if, you, if you haven't thought about any question, my first question, I think um, I got a lot of inspirations and then uh, I think from the international cases you just shared, I think in addition to chasing the truth, I think you all mentioning about some issues of trust. I mean trust in terms of cooperation, right? Between the media, civil society, governments, and uh, in Deborah's case, also trust in terms of human or but uh, whether we can use the technology actually can detect. For Taiwan, we don't use Twitter. So how could we actually maybe have some useful technologies to help us with that? And uh, I think uh, the last speakers actually give a lot of you know thoughts. I'm sorry for this. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's great because I think it's time for us to th rethink about what is journalism. Maybe it's the time for us to think about solutions instead of just criticism. But you mentioned about communities. But sometimes the community, so also we feel like they are filter bubbles. They are in their comfort zone. And how to bridge, I think you mentioned about bridge. And the bridge also requires enough trust to build that bridge. And then people want to contribute, perhaps to your wonderful platform. And they can work together across the borders and to give more solutions, to give uh, global pictures about some important issues like um, immigrant uh, refugees or the water problems, so on and so forth. I think these are very big, but I think all come up with trust and the mistrust, willing to participate or not, and whether people can play the bridge and uh, whether they can communicate or willing to communicate. And uh, in, in, I think in the end of the world, because um, Maybe this kind of digital technologies empower us, but a lot of people also left behind. Yeah, and how could we solve these problems? Uh, yeah, thank you. Trust. Oh, that was a question. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to, uh, to, to uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, trust is, is central to, to uh, everything we do, and I think uh, actually Jakob spoke to that the most. It just comes down to hard work on the part of journalists. Um, um, I think uh, perhaps in the last years or decades, journalists have become a bit more lazy in that regard, relying too much on technology or information that's out there, uh, relying too much on, on press officers or, or, or PR materials to do uh, the work that, uh, that, that that they were doing, and as a, as a result, the trust has eroded, um, and 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 had these platforms um, for all the the technology that we use, and and that technology is certainly an interesting aspect of it, but it, it's not what makes these platform platforms work. What what makes these platforms work is that. Um, at the center of the pl these platforms is that trust relationship that as media, as journalists, you're going to have to build with your audiences. Um, and uh, you are in a better position to sp speak about that, but I would say that, that that's, that's very much the same for, for civic tech communities. Um. Well, journalism is very much also connected to politics, you know, no matter how much we try to avoid it and so on. So if we have a crisis of institutions in general, media are also part of the system which supports democracy. So basically, if we have journalists covering, um, we have to break the cycle, you know, and really focus, I would say, on the people. Like, I'm not sure if this is a like, strategy for the next 20 years. This may be a strategy for the next three years. But we just have to break out of the circle because if people don't trust politicians and media cover what politicians say, then, yeah, n no wonder it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, so, so I'm sorry I don't have like a genius, um, um, you know, um, philosophy to share with you. It's like, it's we just let's try it differently, you know. We will know very soon if it works or not, like in a year or something. Because I think also what's really cool about all those new journalism organizations, they, they are agile, lean, you know, they experiment a lot, they... Uh, they test new solutions, they talk to each other, because I have to tell you that the journalism community doesn't share anything between each other. Um, I'm so happy I'm here. Um, uh, but this is also a huge problem um, in terms of this. So, I don't know, I always think of us that we are like a, this small little dog. We will not destroy the big publishers, but we know we really frustrate them. Uh, like and they notice us. And we see already that they, some of them start in Poland, they started to do change, uh, to change the way they work. Um, 
I just wanted to add on to that a little bit about what mm -hmm. I've said before. It's about um, as soon as we have like different actors on the same table talking about those things, um, they're going to bring their own uh, expertise and approaches to it. So journalists can bring their own expertise, but also civil society organizations can bring their own and technologists can bring their own. So um, when we build those bridges, maybe that is a good way uh, to start, um, you know, kind of rebuilding the trust that we're trying to, to actually figure out where that is. But um, I think you, you touched on a point which is very important, which is about inclusion, right? Um, so when we're talking about technology, what about the people who don't have access to technology, right? So how do we reach out to those people? And sometimes it's a lot about thinking offline, right? How do we go to the most um, local places and how do we uh, try to engage those people, right? It's sometimes trying to uh, invert a little bit about the logic and go to those places and understand how those people have access to technology, how they use it. So for example in Brazil uh, and in Rio specifically there's a case of um, a person, he's called Dando de Antares, and he uh, simply cabled the whole favela because they didn't have access to internet uh, in that specific favela. So what he decided is to create a land house, and that point actually became how people had access to internet and how they could access information and how they could access knowledge. Um, so sometimes it's a little about, when we think about inclusion in that sense, it's a bit about going uh, the other way around. How do those people uh, have, you know, and create different innovative uh, ways to, to access technology, to access the internet, and to then, you know, access information, etc. I just want to add something, like, um, it's not about technology anymore, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's all about a mindset and willingness mm -hmm. to listen, like, that's why I said it. Sometimes I, when I w when I talk about this, it sounds like a, I'm a like a you know coach, because there is lots of those bond mods, you know, like oh you have to listen to other people and so on. But this is kind of true, and I think that we are at this stage where we stopped thinking of technology that as a that it will save and change everything. We just finally started like to, we mastered it, and we are applying technology to problems. I think you will provide very good answers uh, because I think democracy actually based on the majority actually can make the changes and believe in some maybe at least the common philosophies or the values. But uh, if someone uh, has been left behind because of they don't know technologies, they are not familiar with the way how we use them, especially like in the aging society like in Taiwan, we are the global number one or number two. And if we, we all talk about because the elderly people, they don't know about technology, so forget about them because uh, we are all new generations. It's not going to work because uh, one vote is one vote. Elderly also consider us a very important people. That's how I feel from last panel. I, I got that kind of feeling. So I really agree with Deborah and also Jacques because you mentioned about technology is for people and for people, Participatory culture is the new media's, uh, I think, the essence. They empower people, not just for the young people, but for everyone. Should be on the same, on the same, how's that? Mm, we are in the same boat. We need to know as much as possible. Then make the best informed decision for the society and for our country. Okay, uh, sorry I take a lot of time. So is there any questions you would like to ask? Go ahead. Hello. Hey, hi, I'm Maya. Thank you for sharing this uh, precious experience with us. Uh, I can you uh, 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 里面包装的却是一些旧的概念的时候，呃，我们要如何来确保说这个东西确实是能够达到它的目的，而并不只是可能中央或者政府部门在利用这个方式去跟民众沟通的另外一种权威化的工具 ？Yes. <笑> Thank you. 
I, I will try my best to translate. Uh, basically, I think she asked a very important question because we're all concerned about the misinformation, fake news. So globally, people, uh, they try to establish some third party organization and the belief the third party actually can be more independent, objective, to check the facts and, uh, you know, let the society, the general public know what's going on and happening. But uh, sometimes we also feel a bit skeptical because uh, these fact checks, even though it's based on a third party, they are also some sort of organization. And uh, maybe they also have some innovation, so-called innovation maybe. Innovation is a part maybe associated with some uh, different beliefs, agenda, or connected to political parties. And how could we really trust the fact check organization, even though they are so-called independent, even though they are composed of lots of maybe scholars, people are not involved in lots of interests. So can we really trust the third party, the fact check, and how it works in your countries or your experiences? Well, I think it's all about how this organization communicates. So for example, is do they let you in inside the process? Do you know them? Uh, like what we try to do is like we try to show normal life situation from from our lives, you know, so people start to like know us. It's not about that we tell, like we share our opinions, but meetings, where we are, what do we do, and so on. And I believe this is one of the way of just becoming an open organization. And I think that those organizations should also provide a lot of information about them, including funding, uh, what are the goals, basically what I was trying to show with new narrative. So a person can understand what this organization stands for, who funds them, how they spend the money, what is the governance structure. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then magic happens, or not. I think Jakub talked about transparency. Uh -huh. It's who uh -huh. actually made the decision and on what kind of crisis, uh, cr uh, criteria, and who actually behind to make the decision whether to check this is fake or this is true. You can show sources, you can show the process of checking, you know, you can just, not, not, not just say this is true or not, you can say this is true, and then he, and then people can self even check you because I think it's also important to doubt yourself all the time. So you can just link to sources, whatever. How did you come up with that conclusion that, that this is true or not? And that I think is also working. Um, I'll just, just add uh, by saying that I think that tr this is traditionally what the role of media should be. Uh, that isn't to say that media should be objective at at every step of the way. You can have sort of uh, activist journal journalism or, or whatever issue-based journalism so long as you're open about, about, about your sources, about your reasons, about your, your thought process, about, uh, about the, the vetting that you've done, the verification that you've done. But I would say hey, wh what you're suggesting is traditionally what journalists should be doing and if they have that trust relationship, uh, what we talked about earlier, with their audiences, then, then that should not be a problem. Just uh, more directly to your question, should we trust these third-party organizations? Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to say no. Um, uh, and uh, the, the example that directly came to my mind was uh, a fact-checking organization funded by and, and, and set up by the European Parliament that was going to check uh, all uh, articles written about processes in the European Parliament throughout Europe and say whether or not they were true or not. And that is just really, um, we have this expression in Holland, uh, the slager die zijn eigen vlees kleurt. It's basically the butcher that certifies his home meat is fresh. Um, so uh, hey, when you're talking about third parties that are, that are not traditional media, and, and, and especially when they're funded by the organizations they should be checking, I, I'd be very skeptical about it. Yeah, and just uh, again to add on to this, um, besides the whole transparency that Jakub was talking about, and you know, we do have cases that you know, fact checking agencies are not the ones to trust, but if you give people the tools, and, and when you're talking about media literacy, for example, people, they, they, they start to do them by themselves. And then uh, it also becomes a process in which they are empowered and in which they feel part of. Right? So in that sense, uh, when you think about media literacy, it's also about transferring the, 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 the tools or whatever to the people so that they are the ones who are checking and not necessarily it's a third party. It's everyone, right? It's the crowd doing that at the same time. Okay, so last panel, actually I 
I learned something new because uh, we also have uh, like technologies called uh, Cofact. Uh, maybe we can try because everyone can, you know, test on a test space and see whether they can be trustworthy and really can help us to, uh, you know, differentiate true or false or you know, is that half truth or half, you know. And then uh, also, I I know that the third party uh, about the fact chat organizations. Uh, I think just recently established in Taiwan, actually behind is uh, perhaps it's very related to Facebook. And I think it very similar to other cases in other countries because Facebook would like to reclaim you know, its name because all the uh, scandals about Cambridge Analytica. And I also have some friends are working there. They said they really try hard to do that because they want to prove that or let the society or global society to understand their effort. So I think all the intentions perhaps means good. But as a um, public or the, the audiences, we still need to be careful because uh, they are, there could be a lot of things uh, with different perspective, but not necessarily all true. But it's great that they have the intention to set up this kind of institutions and uh, have the civic tech to help us or the bots to detect whether it's human or not human influencing our society. I think all good, but we need to use different technologies to be informed. Um, sorry to interrupt, but there's um, two points I would like to, um, not really a question, but more of a comment. And um, the first one is that um, um, on the um, translation of the lady's question, by the moderator, I think this, there are some key points that the uh, moderate, moderator had misses. Um, the uh, the most important one, I think, is that the lady mentioned the um, the newly newly established Taiwan Fact Checking Center, the organization that um, recently established, and they were actually, I think, more. Um, mainstream media funded and associated. So that's why the ladies say that um, maybe it raises some concerns and we need to get um, closely get closely concerned on whether the reports they produced are are um, uh, authentic. And the, the, uh, the problem that she also mentioned is that those, um, the new fact-checking center um, actually um, rep, rep itself as a um, more of an independent and um, innovative organization, but actually they're, they're, they, they had mainstream background and they actually um, they promote, they're promoting the concepts of um, authority as a uh, authority as a reason for reason for trust. So this can raise problems as um, in um, in in situations like in situations like this, we talk about innov innovations, technologies, and modern journalism. But it's but we we know that transparency will will let facts uh, or truth to be um, more to to get more attention than the than the misinformation. But with up security and authority in in your mind then things can can get more complicated so i think this is a um concern that the lady mentioned but it's not talk it's not um being talked on the panels so ju just mentioning it again and the second one is um the moderator she also mentioned a thing is that um you said jiang na ge taiwan 40 cha he zhong xin ma oh 40 is Oh, how, so, so um, the moderator had mentioned the Taiwan Fact Checking Center has been related to Facebook, which I am um, really interested to hear the, to to hear on. Yes. So, so just um, just a, a note on this authority um, kind of argument. Um, so this is, for example, what I mentioned about Brazil. Uh, we had the case that uh, the Supreme Electoral Court uh, established a council to decide what is fake news or not and therefore uh, take down content. But when you don't have, uh, you know, uh, an approach which is um, a multi-stakeholder approach, then they make mistakes as they have been doing since they started this council. 
I, I don't know exactly the way the, the Taiwan uh, fact check organization is set up. Um, but uh, it, if it does come from, from uh, essentially what you call mainstream media, and it sounds to me that uh, the way they are shaped could very well be almost like an ombudsman-like structure, which I think is, is not, not a bad idea for media to have to begin with. Um, uh, but I, I'd really need to know a little bit more to comment in, in depth about that. Do you have a relevant question you can ask first? And then I we'll think uh, she was talking about cold facts. Um, so like in Taiwan, Twitter is not that common. And WhatsApp is like, OK, the most popular source is Line. And there are a lot of fake news online. That's why uh, uh, like the lady was talking about cold facts. That's an organization. It was actually one of yesterday's panelists. And they were talking about this you can throw feed the information into their bot and they will analyze it and respond uh, whether if this is a uh, fake news or not that is our fact checked for line instead of whatsapp because it's not that popular and uh, speaking of that i i would like to ask miss deborah um for the bots part uh is it possible that because the ai technology is so advanced right now is it possible that uh, the bots are so well trained that they don't behave like bots and if that's the case I believe that is the case um, how do you distinguish a well trained bot and a brainless real person like that <laughs> like <laughs> how do you do that <laughs> and actually I have a second question for Mr. Yaku um, so I believe you probably heard of a Facebook page called Humans of New York, and he's a photographer. He posts a lot of pictures, not just New York, but over the world, and to uh, reveal their um, reveal their their stories, so they can share their stories. So I believe that is a very transparent first step for the modern journalism that you were talking about, like revealing uh, real people's real stories. Um, my question is, uh, I believe there are a lot more to build on that base because this web page has gained a lot of trust from public and people trust their stories and people enjoy reading their stories and what can we improve the modern journalism based on that? You go first, I have to think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on your question, um, of course, you are completely correct. This is something that can happen, right? So th that's why we, um, when we talk about Pegabot, which is the tool that we've developed, that's why we think about it as a media literacy tool. The idea is that um, the information that you're going to have on that little box and um, what you're going to actually grasp from it is to understand the environment better, right? Um, so that's why, for example, we give percentages. Right? We don't say it is a bot or it isn't a bot. It's impossible to give a binary answer to that question. Right? Um, so in that sense, we do analyze a few elements within uh, the whole profile right? or the account that uh, that person typed in our research bar. But of course, it's something that you know the algorithm is still there. We have to keep training it, we have to continue uh, you know, refining it so that it understands better what it means. But when it analyzes, it not only analyzes language, but it analyzes emotions, or it analyzes the frequency with which uh, that profile posts, if it's an exact time, for example. Um, so all of these elements are taken into consideration before uh, we actually give you an answer. But still, it's an answer that is not definite. Uh, it's an answer that is going to be uh, refined and refined and refined. And again, uh, if you are a, a technologist, I invite you to go to our GitHub uh, repository and help us out to refine our algorithm the best um, we, can, we can. Thank you. Uh, can I add up to that? Because uh, recently, uh, Stanford uh, law professor just came to Change University, and then he also mentioned about the bug problems. The bug problem pro perhaps is much more difficult to sort out, uh, you know, compared with the so-called man-made, you know, misinformation. Because right now, the bug can be very intelligent. At the same time, it a actually can use the big data, artificial intelligence, to 
trick people, sort of influencing people to click certain buttons. So if you trace down whether this is met, you know, the selection is met by human. Yes, it is. It's not met by but, but the but has the function to actually understand who you are and what kind of things can let you to make certain decisions. So that will be even more difficult and chaotic future. But I think that's the first step to differentiate how but um, actually are the intelligent or but buster is more intelli intelligence than we can think about even internationally, there's some businesses to use the bots to influence the political situation. So we need to be uh, really careful about this situation. And also add on to, actually there are two platforms. Uh, the gentleman asked, the first one is Di Sanfang Cha He Ji Go, which is an organization just newly established. But the fact, the core fact is a CV technologies for everyone to use. I'm not aware of whether it's related to the mainstream media or totally, definitely will be some like a Facebook uh, behind, but uh, maybe they are they having some uh, associations. But I think the most important thing is we need to check what they have done. Instead of just say someone behind and then we don't trust them. That may not be, uh, you know, the no answer, negative uh, rejection in the very beginning. I think every step we need to observe. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, so you know, I believe that um, these days uh, trust is the best currency. You either have it or not. And once you do, you can do amazing things. And I do believe that if humans of New York would want to start anything, from a vegetable shop to a journalist organization, the audience would follow because they, they trust them. And uh, because that's how it is, you know, people trust you and he can take any turn. Um, but what we see also is that. Mm, is that many influencers start to go enter journalism. You know, people who for past eight years started as Twitter folks, then they started YouTube channels or they were bloggers. They see that they have a huge reach. They are also getting older, so they look differently and they start to think what they can do with the impact they have on their community and the trust they have amassed over the years. One of the examples which I follow is an uh, American YouTuber called Philip DeFranco. He's, he announced, I don't know, a year ago maybe, that he's building a news network through Patreon. And he has over 16,000 people contributing to him financially, monthly. And he's delivering shows for them and so on and so on. But he started as a kid on YouTube, you know, doing some shows. And then he started to do the news and so on and so on. So this is a very powerful thing. And I do think that, you know, especially influencers. I know that you have used them as a different kind of example, and I do believe there's a lot of bad things happening in that sphere, and so on and so on. But uh, I have been a blogger myself, and that was also a key for us to building uh, our platform, uh, working with community, and having already some people willing to follow us. And we have decided to go this way. Uh, because of time, we need to wrap up this session, and uh, I really appreciate the very three insightful and inspiring guests and then speakers share lots of experiences with us. I would like you to use maybe 30 seconds. If you want to say more, then we will call it uh, the end of this. Don't panel. drink the coffee. Don't drink the coffee. Don't drink the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you use up your 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, 30 seconds, oh sorry, that sort of came out of the blue. Um, well, th thank you so much for your <laughs> attention. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here in Taiwan as well. And f Well, I for sure, I'm, I'm looking into the Cofax uh, uh, platform myself and see if we can replicate that model elsewhere because I think it's a really interesting one. Um, if there's any more questions, just find me or us, I guess, uh, uh, outside the room afterwards. And um, yeah, see you later. I just uh, want to, again, thank you all and say, please tell me a little bit more Chinese than ni hao and xie xie because I really want to learn that. Xie xie. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you everyone to participate and listen to the wonderful presentation today. Uh, you can go to the next section. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>